thank you so much for being here, Brian, and for, you know, all of the, the ways that you work in the world. Um, I am, I've been thinking, especially today, I had a, I had a workshop today in a, in a military health space. Um, and there was this sort of like, almost as they were introducing integrative medicine and sort of these like I, other, other practices, there was a lot of like, this isn't just hippie stuff. It's also evidence-based or like, you know, it may seem real woo woo. And it was all this like sort of diminishing, almost apologetic language that came before introducing this really powerful work, right? Um, and I think a lot about like how uncomfortable people are mm. with anything that might seem other than rational, yeah. right? Which is actually most of our lived experience is like right. <laughs> deeply irrational. Um, and you've of course brought this work into all of these very similar spaces where they're, you know, driven by the quantitative and and fear, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. of emotions. Um, what have you learned from those people? So, I mean, the work that Theater of War Productions has been doing for almost 12 years now, a, a large portion of it, and the part, part that maps on to what you were just describing, has been for um institutional audiences that for wholly adaptive and reasonable um concerns and reasons practice a kind of clinical detachment from their work um as much as i'm an evangelist for people connecting with their feelings and um feeling what it would be appropriate to feel uh at the right time uh, I also concede that it's not, you know, if I have a surgeon operating on my heart, I, I don't want his hand or her hand or their hand to be shaking. I don't, I don't want uh, someone crying into my wound. I, I want someone to fix me. And if someone's in battle, uh, it may not be the time to be overwhelmed with emotions. And if someone's an EMS professional who's rescuing someone, you know, so um, the, the core idea behind the work we do is that um, we acknowledge that um, certain forms of kind of compartmentalization and detachment may be adaptive and, and also helpful to certain types of work, um, perhaps not all the time, but for certain types of emergency-based work especially, um, but that what the Greeks knew and we've rediscovered through the work that we do is that there, there has to be a time, uh, a time for people to connect with and acknowledge what they, what they feel and, and, um, and the impact of doing these things upon them. And the myth of sort of eternal compartmentalization and, um, and the sort of toxicity of that idea is something that our work is very much trying to address, to create spaces and places and times for that reckoning and that interrogation to occur. Um, so I've met a lot of people in those spaces hospitals, military bases, prisons, um, you know, addiction uh, facilities, recovery facilities, um, you know, all kinds of places um, who uh, really are hungry for this experience and, and want it and don't really have any way to it because what passes for communication in our culture right now, even about issues like suicide are, are, are things like PowerPoint and or, or sort of blistering lectures given by people from a place of authority or, or mental health professionals talking in a way that makes you never want to see a mental health professional. And um, so, you know, I think there's just so much room for the type of communication and exchange that um, great, great literature, great writing can inspire. Um, I've also met a lot of people who are deeply, deeply afraid of, of what happens when you open those floodgates. I think, you know, everyone's afraid of that. High school teachers are afraid of that. No one wants to be de facto mental health professional if they don't have the training. Um, and it requires, you know, taking that risk. You can't ask someone to do a free write and not, and try to legislate what comes back, <laughs> right. uh, as you know, in your work. And you can't ask people what they think about a 
an ancient play about war and then try to, you know, box them in in some way. So um, what I've learned is, um, you know, that really great leaders see the value in what we do and they keep bringing us back into their institutions to help them do what they can't do, right. which is to create a kind of um, leaderless environment um, where people are given permission to, to express their truth. Yeah, and you know, as you were talking about all of these professions in which like that sort of heroism compartmentalization is necessary, um, like in parenting too, right? Like your oh, kids yeah. make you spitting mad and you have <laughs> to put it away and be like, this is moment is not about me. Um, and then you also need like space to be like, but that really hurt my feelings, right? right? You know, it's, it's like, it's a human, we, we do have to have both of these sort of modes. Um, Boy, I, I, to I told you, I mean, there really isn't. So I thought, so that sort of leads me to where we are now, which is that in the beginning, we were working with institutions that practice a kind of clinical detachment. And now we, we perform plays that like cut across human experiences that touch everyone and render us feeling isolated or without an ability to express how we feel. Um, we did a, you know, we did a reading of a poem recently, I think you might have attended with, uh, by, with Poetry in America, Robert Hayden's um, Those Winter Sundays, where Hayden talks about, in some ways, presumably, the narrator of his poem talks about certain regrets he feels um, about the way he treated his father or the, his lack of understanding of his father, his father's love, uh, until he was probably of an age to experience being a father himself. And he says, what did I know? What did I know of love's lonely offices? Um, you know, yeah, uh, parenting, relationships, um, chronic illness, you know, structural racism. Like there are just so many paths to feeling isolated and cut off, not just from other people, but also from your own feelings and your own ability to express them. And where is their time? Where is their space to do that? And I feel like we've commodified, you know, all these different art forms so that they're about something that should be consumed. You know, you pay for them and you consume them. But in fact, the reason we go back to the ancients is we're going back to a culture and a time where I think they knew that uh, in order to be of use, they, they couldn't be consumed. They had to be, they had to be messy and they had to present people with questions rather than solutions. And they had to give people the opportunity to express their voices. Um, and that's what this work has been all about. Um, and, you know, uh, some of the institutions we work with have been extremely desperate to find ways to, you know, start these conversations. And, um, you, know, it ha you know, 12 years later, it seems uncoincidental that we have had a seemingly endless stream of work uh, because there's just so much work to be done. Yeah, there's a sort of like um, idea of the arts as entertainment versus like sacred experience, right? Um, but yeah, us, we've opened our workshops up um, and we did a workshop for an employee resource group recently. Mm. 805 people came to this workshop called Writing Has Saved My Life. Like they were just like, yeah, like make me cry. Um, because there seems to be this recognition that there's stuff that needs to be worked through. Um, and also this sense of like lack of emotional literacy, right? Like how do I even put this in words? Um, and I wondered sort of how you came to emotional literacy, how you came to not be personally, not be like, did you grow up with really talky people? Cause I know in my family, it was just like, eh. And I reached this boiling point where I was like, this is choking me, nah. I've got to say it. Um, yeah, yeah, well, so, I mean, uh, yeah, full, full disclosure, my parents are both psychologists, uh, but not like both therapists. One was an experimental psychologist and the other worked with young young people with disabilities primarily and their families but you know we talked a lot it was a hyperverbal place but that I, I you know I, I actually 
can't claim to have reached the place where I'm emotionally literate. I, I, you know, it's like, I know enough to know that I'm, you know, I, I'll spend the rest of my life working on it and, and never get there. But um, it's out of my own illiteracy that, um, and, and my own need and desire to create a space where people would be able to talk about some of the things I experienced, namely caring for someone I loved who died, caring for a parent who died, um, you know, the isolation of meeting the sort of limits of my own compassion, feeling helpless in the face of someone else's suffering that I couldn't stop. These are things that I think we all at some point get to encounter. I encounter them in my um, early 20s. Some people encounter them earlier in life. Some people don't get to have the privilege until they're much older. Um, but it was out of the necessity of finding a way to talk to others that didn't make them recoil mm. at the things that I'd experienced that I developed my own, I don't know if it's my own literacy or just a, a sort of shared vocabulary or platform where people have been able to express themselves in ways that's hugely enriching to me. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, it is. It is like it's a constant stepping into towards yourself, right? This like path towards emotional literacy. And sometimes I think that the best any of us can do is show up knowing that we don't know, right? Like just I don't I don't know, um, but I want to. Um, and you, of course, if you know if somebody hasn't been to one of your productions, you have the play, and then. The real meat is, of course, the conversation that happens, um, which you have no idea what's going to happen, right? You know the script that your actors are going to perform, um, but you do this really deft guiding of the conversation that's not, it's a, it's a real light touch of like um, managing that. How long did it take you to get good at that? Real talk. <laughs> In brief, it took it took about a hundred performances, uh, mm -hmm. and half of them, well, not half, a quarter of them really didn't go according to plan. And um, you know, a few of them, I had my ass handed to me by military audiences in particular who weren't having it. And um, you know, some people do stand up comedy and they go to clubs and they actually sort of revel in failing yeah um and the humiliation of that failure forces the innovation that gets them to the place where they can achieve the glory of whatever that is that laugh that they're after and mm -hmm. i think it's a similar path for me of like knowing that i couldn't go up against a thousand marines you know 20 times and fail and want to keep doing it and i'd had a taste of early success with the project when theater of war when we performed for 400 Marines and they opened up and they told their stories at a time when it was seen as a career ending gesture to share your story or um, that you were struggling in some way. And, and um, so it took, it took uh, some hard knocks and out of those hard knocks, um, I developed a series of strategies. And some of them were things that I would say to an audience to try to put them at ease. And some of them were about me not apologizing for who I was or pretending to be of the tribe for whom we're right. performing, which I think is a big trap. Mm -hmm. of getting too like overly identifying with people that you're working with to the point where you can't serve them. Um, or, or partially it was just hierarchical things that I learned about the institutions within, I was, within which we were working. Like I just needed someone that the audience respected to introduce me in a way that was gracious and that could just create the opening that I needed to get through. But if someone didn't provide that gracious introduction, then I'd be fighting against the potential judgment that was already in the room. So. Right. So, you know, in the early days, I sort of reveled in um, awkward silences during our discussions. And, you know, there's utility in silence, but I've also come to really, um, you know, it's, it's very much about like generating all this energy through the performance and then moving the energy around the room. And that sounds really esoteric, but um, the more one does it, and I'm, you know, the 1200 performances in, the better one gets at it. And there's no real training other than just to, to do it. Is there, um, is there anything from it, from managing these sort of extreme, extremely large groups of people through, not managing them, but um, guiding these large groups of people through difficult material that 
um, you think translates to the dinner table, to like places where people are trying to have, you know, trying to overcome silences in their own lives, with their own families, with their own parents that might think differently than them? I mean, our basic strategies about mediation, um, it's really hard for any of us to talk about anything that's right in front of us, no matter how deft we are, or adept we are at talking about things. Uh, and so we, we as human beings develop stories to serve as sort of Trojan horses for our own emotion. I mean, like, you know, we can all interpret a story. We can all, we, don't, we can't all agree about politics. We can't all agree about, you know, certain moral questions. We can't all agree about the family secret, uh, but, but we can all respond to a story and so part of, you know, what I suggest, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't claim to be a therapist and I, you know, in some ways my work was a reaction to growing up in a family of, of therapists, like to create something that didn't feel like medicine or jargon. Mm -hmm. um, so people could relate to it and engage. And I think it's the most basic thing. Like we as human beings sit around campfires and tell stories and share our stories uh, and create these fictional structures often because they bring us closer than any other strategy would to the very thing we're trying to you know access and address so i think you know what we do as a as a you know as a structure could be adapted to the living room or the dining room and i think it does get adapted people see our performances now on zoom in their homes and I, we hear of how they continue talking afterwards and it opens something up um if i you know i don't describe what we do as therapy but i do think it's a door yeah. Um, and it's this sort of neutral place where people can all come together uh, with a kind of radical non judgment that's based on the fact that, you know, there's really not, not much at stake when we're just talking about agreeing, you know, hearing each other's interpretation. Um, you know, we, we can all hear each other's interpretations, even if we vehemently disagree. Um, and that gives us just enough air and and space to, I think, access the thing that maybe we didn't have the courage or the capacity or the vocabulary or the syntax to address the elephant in the room that was always there.